If everybody has the same ideas and the same theories and builds in the same place, we're missing out. Thank you, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you on this beautiful day. Um, if we believe the headlines, quantum computing is going to revolutionize the world. It has attracted tens of billions of dollars in investment involving the largest global tech companies. But some leading scientists are arguing it is little more than a hoax. Quantum computers, they claim, have fundamental problems that show no sign of being addressed or in principle of being solvable. The technology relies on qubits. Only a handful have ever been made and they need to operate barely above absolute zero and cohere, they cohere for a mere 50 microseconds. No result they claim has been calculated that is of any practical consequence. Should we recognize that few understand quantum buzzwords like entanglement and superposition so that even the sophisticated are at risk of being taken in by hype. Should funders, investments, and governments be highly skeptical of quantum vocabulary, along with the rest of us when reading articles promoting a quantum future? Or are these skeptical challenges to the quantum world a threat to a vital breakthrough that risk undermining funding and allowing others, including China, to take a global lead? So, on to our speakers. Joshua Bach is a cognitive scientist and AI researcher for MIT Media Lab and the Harvard Program for Evolutionary Dynamics. He's the mind behind MicroSci, a cognitive architecture which describes the interaction of emotion, motivation, and cognition of situated agents. Ruth Alton is a photonics expert Professor of Photonics and EPRC Quantum Technologies Fellow at the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs at the University of Bristol. And Dominic Wall Walliman is a science writer, quantum physicist, and YouTube sensation. <laughs> <laughs> he writes the award-winning Professor Astro Cat Science Books for Children. Please welcome the three of them. Okay, so uh, I'm going to let each of them give uh, their three-minute overview about uh, the quantum hoax. So let's start with Yosha. In the late 90s, uh, Danny Hillis wrote a wonderful book about computation. It's called The Pattern on the Stone. It's a very nice monograph that I used in class. And uh, everything in this book has aged exceptionally well including the chapter about quantum computing, which is just around the corner, 25 years ago. And uh, I wouldn't say that uh, quantum computing is a hoax, but it is an extremely bold proposal. And it's uh, the proposal that we can achieve something that nature hasn't done, that we're able to build something that is computing polynomially faster than any kind of classical process. If you look at the computers that we are building today, that we're using, if you look at our, our brains and all the interactions that we can observe in nature, they're all made of dynamics that we can describe as the interaction of particles or something equivalent. And um, quantum computing suggests that we can go below this level of the particle universe and tap directly into the CPU of the universe. And that the CPU of the universe is running much, much faster than uh, the particle dynamics that we are seeing and that we are made of. Right? So it's an extremely bold proposal that is being made. And it's so complex that relatively few people actually understand its implications. And um, in the past, some of the people who saw the implications that there might be a possibility to bi basically bypass the particle universe with some arcane technology and build computers that are dramatically faster for some applications at least. And this is an extremely bold statement and it consists of two parts. One is we can build a non-local machine, which has been built, right? You were involved in D-Wave. And uh, the other one is hypercomputation. It really makes, uh, it's about building something that is able to compute faster than a classical computer. And this might not be possible. But, uh, or if it is po uh, possible, it m might still not imply that the Church-Turing thesis, uh, the 
computer science statement that all computers have basically the same power, just differ in memory that they have and processing speed. This will probably not be broken, right? And there's the question, does quantum computing make the claim that it breaks this? Is quantum computing in part based on some faulty part of physics because the physicists have checked out the code base from the mathematicians uh, before Gödel happened and before mathematics was forced to become constructive. So maybe there are some specifications in the mathematics that we use to describe quantum mechanics that lead, uh, give rise to hopes that we can build computers that cannot be built. And to me, it's very, very exciting to observe these developments because there are open metaphysical questions to be answered and whether this is being built. With respect to the practical uh, implications of funding, uh, a large amount of funding that was be made available as part of the stimulus packages during COVID and so on. And uh, I found that when I talked to some of these companies that the people in these companies did not actually understand how to build a quantum computer, which was very frightening to me. They did not understand the underlying physics. They were hoping that we have this physicist, our company, who's going to figure this out for us, <laughs> but we are all building this amazing machine that's all going to make us rich if it ever works. Right? So it's <laughs> a lot like crypto. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is enough as a start. My three minutes are over. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Ruth. Okay, that's a good starting point. So I think we're here to discuss the hype about quantum computing. And I'm a researcher that's been working on this topic for the past sort of 20 years. And even I would say that, yes, quantum computing is somewhat hyped, but actually I'm not too bothered about it. And that's because all emerging technologies, all disruptive technologies undergo a very well-known hype cycle where there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of investment, it goes up, and then disillusionment when it doesn't immediately come to fruition. And then the winning technologies tend to be invested in long term and you see a kind of slow recovery and these become mature technologies. So this has already happened with AI and quantum computing is somewhere along that curve. And it's what we expect, actually. There is some, some um, questionable journalism sometimes about the claims around quantum computing, most actual um, scientists working on it are actually much more circumspect, but really there's some, there is some hype and, and we do admit that. So why invest all this money in quantum computing if you don't even know it's going to work? Well, what we're actually doing is investing in computing. So actually there haven't been many developments in quantum computing hardware that really changed the way we process information. We've been working on silicon chips um, for the past sort of 50 years. What we've been doing is making them smaller and cheaper. Uh, that's given us huge computational power increases, but now we're coming to the point where transistors are only a few atoms in, in length and we can't go much further. So we need some big revolution in, in computing. And quantum computing should be one of those, okay? I think what we need to ask ourselves is, what's the worst case scenario after investing all this money? Well, the worst case scenario is that we don't have a quantum computer at the end of it. and I would say that's still not a disaster because actually what we've learned to do is manipulate information with single particles and the amount of energy you need um, per particle to do a calculation suddenly becomes very small. So it looks like a route to do very efficient, low power computing. Um, and that is something that's going to become very important. And we're also training a huge number of um, physicists who have um, and engineers who've got basic understanding and they've got technical know-how and if that if quantum computing doesn't work they'll go and use those skills somewhere else and because they're doing something extremely challenging they'll be able to apply that mindset to all sorts of other fields but actually i think with the progress the way it's going we will see quantum computers i don't know when it will be but i i expect within the next 10 or 20 years we'll see a useful quantum computer thank you okay let's go to dominic yeah so my um approach to this so i used to work in a quantum computer company uh, one of the first ones called d-wave in canada um and then i left to be a youtuber um so what in terms of the hype around quantum computing it's not a hoax um because companies like google and ibm don't plow hundreds of millions of dollars into things that are a hoax they're 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 clever people they know what they're doing um in terms of the hype around it, I think it is hyped, but the hype isn't even everywhere. So certain places make grand claims, which I would consider hype. Other places are more measured about it. And what I try and do on my YouTube channel is to have a sober measured um, communication about uh, quantum computing to 
to give people as many tools as they can to critically analyze the claims that come out. And the, and the good thing about quantum computing, which um, gives me encouragement, is that there are actual metrics to be able to measure the progress of quantum computers. And there are specific criteria. So there's this thing called Di Vincenzo's criteria, which are a set of engineering milestones that they need to accomplish to be able to make what we'd consider a working quantum computer. And so what you can do is you can look at the industry and you can't see inside the companies, obviously, because they're keeping everything secret. So you can only look at what they're publishing and you can track what their roadmaps are. That's the other encouraging thing is that they've published roadmaps about how many qubits, how big the quantum computers are going to be over a certain amount of time, projecting into the future. And you can track those and then you can track actually which of these criterions they've met. And so this is an empirical, rational approach to a emerging technology. So that's the thing to focus on, like actually how are they progressing over time? And the, the claims, the hype, uh, which we'll probably get to, is like exactly what they can be used for in the future. And that's where you get a lot of space for people to make up all sorts of... Um, shenanigans uh but i think the 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 basic uh promise is to simulate quantum systems with a quantum computer if you've got a quantum computer it's made out of a quantum system so it's natural that you can use that to simulate chemical reactions and that can be very useful for, for many different things um and those chemical reactions are typically very hard to simulate on normal computers and the other thing to say is quantum computers aren't some magic machine that will be able to solve anything they've got a very specific realm where um, normal computers today if you want to play you know computer games um, quantum computers aren't going to help with that rendering graphics classical computers they're they're brilliant at that so we need to be like measured about what they will be good at and what they won't okay wonderful so let's go to our first question about this i think all of the speakers have talked about the excitement of quantum theory. This is the way the physical world seems to work. Quantum theory is one of the best established areas of physics, extremely successful. But uh, what that very success of quantum physics has uh, led to this um, or supported this hype that quantum physics is now going to produce a totally spectacular computer that is going to dramatically supersede you know anything we've seen so far so let's talk specifically about the hype why is it that fundamental science is used to generate extreme hype which then pulls in lots of investment is this a rational way for the world to work so first of all i don't think that there is so much of a hype about quantum computing outside of a very narrow circles and also i don't think that it attracts a lot of funding a uh, hundred million dollars might sound a lot to most of us who don't have a hundred million dollars in the bank, but <laughs> the amount of funding that, for instance, went into deep learning is many magnitudes more. And if quantum computing would ever work, it would be a trillion dollar industry. If uh, Google is not putting many billions of dollars into quantum computing, it believes that uh, means Google doesn't believe that quantum computing is going to work near term in a scalable way. Right, so the practical relevance of this technology based on the amount of funding that currently goes into it su suggests that the smartest investors who put money into it do not bet on it working. It is more like an also <laughs> run on the chance that it might work. Of course, we should invest into it if we are Google and are, have uh, in unlimited riches uh, on the chance that it works. Definitely, we should be pushing for it and something useful is probably going to come out of it. But it's consistent with these people who put money into it being okay with it not working, right? So uh, I think that's that's fine. We should, I think, develop basic technologies that have a chance of not working. Because <laughs> if they work, they are super useful. We should not put money into stuff where we, ha uh, where we see no chance that they're working, except in a few, very few cases. Like my friend, uh, the chemist Lee Cronin, uh, has ideas that are wrong. And he has them out in the open. And he is willing to have these ideas that are wrong or, where he, or, or rather where he does not completely know why they are true. 
or how they could be arguably true or that contradict the evidence. I'm and sure. this enables him uh -huh. to build things that nobody else is building. And these things are working. They might be working for different reasons than his theories, but <laughs> he is very smart and he is very creative and productive and it's uh, uh, very useful to work on all sorts of areas and tinker and just see what comes out of this. And if everybody has the same ideas and the same theories and builds in the same place, we're missing out. For podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.